Hello and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we're talking with John Rosario, the DP of A Lot of Nothing, which just uh, premiered at South by Southwest a few weeks ago. Uh, John is an amazing man. Uh, we really uh, had a great conversation this week. Um, you know, I think, <laughs> wouldn't it be amazing if one of these weeks I was like, and you know, the guest ate dog shit and I hated him. <laughs> I've loved, I've loved every conversation, man. This has been so fun. Um, and it continues to be. Anyway, uh, John has a fascinating uh, sort of story. Um, you know, uh, immigrant parents, uh, you know, workman, uh, workman-like family. You know, he became an engineer and then went to film school for two years and then dropped out. And then uh, became an incredible um, DP, uh, has a fantastic eye. And we talk about all of that, and um, I really think you're going to enjoy it. So, all of that and more, as as usual. You know, I, I, I don't I don't spend these intros summarizing an hour and a half of conversation. I think it's better if you just listen to it because uh, that's why podcasts exist. So, um, I'm going to let you get to it. Here's my conversation with John Rosario. So. Uh, the way that we usually start these is by uh, asking how you got started. I understand you uh, didn't really, you you didn't start as a cinematographer. You started as an engineer, kind of, yeah, as, as a younger guy. Yeah. So so you know my my folks they they uh, they emigrated from the Dominican Republic over to you know New York, and so I guess I'm a, you know I'm a first generation American, and so with that they brought some the, the these this value these values with them where. You know, you choose a job that pays really well, that's respectable, and that's kind of it, you know. And so the arts wasn't really nurtured uh, in my household growing up, Um, you know, because my my folks were like, you know, blue collar, hardworking people. And so, you know, when it came time to go to college and, uh, you know, I was looking at at a list of things like, okay, what's what's interesting? What what pays well was the, the first thing I was asking myself. And I looked at engineering. I was like, okay, engineering sounds respectable. That sounds cool. Uh, civil engineering, great. Let's let's just do that. And I went to um, went to a community college in New York for civil engineering for one year. And I kind of jumped into film like it was just like by chance. Like I, I yeah, it, it didn't it didn't happen um, because it's something that I loved and always wanted to do, and just it, it was just completely by chance. You know, while attending, you know, school for civil engineering, I met with a friend of mine uh, who's who's a musician and we were just having lunch and um, having a conversation. And he, he posed the question to me, you know, he goes, he goes, hey, do you do you see yourself happy being an engineer? And like the world, like time just stopped and everything <laughs> was froze and my mind kind of just became mush because I never thought to equate happiness with what you do. I always thought, you know, my, my, my parents think the same way. It's like, you know, I always thought, you know, okay, work is work and you make money and then you go home and your fun comes outside of work. So happiness and what you do just never, never really clicked for me. And I, was, and I answered him, I said, you know, I, yeah, I don't think I would be happy being a civil engineer at all. Uh, I'd be miserable, in fact. And he goes, well, what makes you happy? And uh, I go, well, you know, I, I like watching movies. And I really did as a kid, you know, I'd always like, glue myself to, to TV and just, just watch all types of movies, like just anything. And, um, and I saw that, I was like, you know, I, I, I like watching movies and he goes, well, why don't you go to film school? And I said, yeah, I guess, I guess so. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll go to film school. <laughs> and so I went to film school. Um, and you know, I only lasted two years out of the four. I dropped out after two years, but super valuable time. Um, cause I, I was able to really find, what it is I was actually wanting to do and, um, and pursue cinematography after that. So it was, it was very valuable that I did that. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Uh, you, you have, again, as I said, I'm going to be jumping around all over the place, but yeah. uh, I kind of wanted to know, cause I, I had a, I had, uh, my parents were like, yeah, do whatever the fuck you want. But, yeah. um, 
watching movies was always the same. What I'm trying to get at the same, you know, kind of thing. I just loved yeah. watching movies as a kid. And that's what got me into cinematography. But I'm wondering um, for you, was it always entertainment or did you start to analyze films early on? Or did you have to learn that muscle? Cause I certainly had to learn it. It was completely entertainment as a kid. Um, and it, it actually, it wasn't until going to film school that I started to develop that language of dissecting films and, and feeling films, you know, or, or explaining the feelings that I was feeling, you know, as a kid, I would feel these feelings, but it would, I wouldn't equate it to anything that people were doing behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it was, you know, once I started going to film school, I started to, to see, I guess, for lack of better words. Yeah. Cause it's that, it's that, uh, did you, did you find that you had trouble trusting those feelings in regards to, uh, you know, it can be like, oh, this is how I, this is, I saw this Kurosawa film and this is how I felt. And people will be like, no, that's the wrong interpretation. And you go, oh, fuck. Okay, cool. My bad. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's, it's you well, yeah, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Um, you know, I remember my freshman year, you know, you know, when you go to film school, there's always like the film snobs, right? The, 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 yeah. the guys and gals that have seen every black and white film and, you know, no, no, knows the names of every, of every actor, director and everyone involved. And so it's a little intimidating going into those circles. And I remember the professor going around asking, hey, so, you know, what's what's what what films really speak to you right now? <laughs> and I remember, you know, everyone went around and said their films. You know, one guy said His Girl Friday, one said Citizen Kane. And, you know, so they went down the line with the classics. <laughs> and I was the only one that said, you know, man, I'll fire. <laughs> right. You know, and they were like, film. Fuck, uh, yeah, yeah, truly. And Denzel, man, and just, you know, um, One of his best, for sure. Truly, truly, and uh, and so I mentioned Man on Fire, and like the kind of the, cl- the class kind of like laughed at that. You know, it's like Man on Fire. It's like you know it, we're, we're talking about Citizen Kane, and you're mentioning Man on Fire. But then, to, you know, what I tried to express to them was like, you know, what I really appreciated about the film was just the the visual choices that they made. You know, because I think it was like multi formatted cameras, and just like it was very it was very fresh, edgy, and unique at the time, and I, and I was really attracted to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so to answer your question, yeah, there was that um, that that intimidation, I guess. Uh, or, I think any you know. nineteen year old who says their favorite film is Citizen Kane is full of shit. Like they definitely <laughs> read a book that said like that's what the the movie that they're supposed to like, and then they go like, right. "Oh, it's that one. Give me an A." Yeah, for sure. I actually had the same uh, experience uh, in film school. I but my answer was Men in Black, and everyone went, "Oh, <sighs> really." <laughs> and to this day, Another, to this day, it's one yeah. of my favorite films. Man, Will Smith, man, one of my favorites for the sure. Best. Well, and someone had explained uh, to me that Men in Black is is somewhat unique in that it's one of the few movies where the hero chooses the adventure. Most of the time, right. the the adventure's thrust upon them, and in that one, you've got Will coming in and going like, "Here's the thing: you respect the skills. I'm here because I want to be, you know, that thing." And yeah, I think that makes that film a lot of fun. Truly, truly, yeah. Uh, so your, uh, your dad was a, was a, uh, a car painter or a mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my father, you know, he was a mechanic at first and then he started, he opened up his own, you know, car and body shop where he would just, you know, fix, uh, cars and, you know, collision cars. Um, so he would, you know, re- repair them, paint them and all that. Then he, then he had like a tow truck business. So it was like very, all, everything surrounded around cars. And as a kid, I would, you know, spend my summers at the shop, just kind of like um, watching these these cars just being become transformed from just like trash to just just being reborn, essentially, and just being painted. And um, yeah, I spent a lot of summers just sweeping the floors and watching the, the the mechanics and the and the and the folks just like repairing old cars. It was kind of did that. Of, it, what's that? I was going to say, did that um, kind of uh, problem solving and work ethic, ethic rub off on you at all? Or did you fucking hate that? <laughs> I, there was parts of it that I that I disliked for sure. Um, but there but there was parts of it as a kid, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of see see this kind of stuff, you know, just see. Um, but I, I think inadvertently so this, this this work ethic for sure um, rubbed off. I never really thought about it until now. I never really equated how this stuff contributed to who I am now. But but I definitely see that now. I see how it has for sure. Good question. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just something that I've been thinking about a lot is like uh, the the random little things that had nothing to do with 
film school or, or uh, artistry in any form that kind of inform my work. You know, yeah. um, I've, uh, music was an, always an easy one to link up, you know, but then there's, you know, other stuff like um, magic. I've really recently really been getting oh. into um, I, I was a magician like my whole childhood and just only recently have started to draw parallels between them or like, um, you know, love of engineering or anything like that, like architecture. I've noticed a lot of DPs uh, were architects at one point or studied architecture and stuff like that. It's, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, and I think maybe this is why I chose civil engineering and not architecture um, as, a, as, a, as a focus after high school. Um, as a kid, I used, to, I used to draw a lot as a kid, you know, just like random stuff, you know, just little, little things or whatever. And I went through a period where I would draw my own blueprints of like dream homes that I would want. And if, I don't know how I got to this point of drawing blueprints. It, it wasn't like thrust it upon me and no one said, Hey, try this. It was just like something I just started doing one day and just started drawing out schematics and dream homes and things like that. And yeah, it's just, I guess, I guess there is some court connection there too. Yeah. It's, I wonder what that is. I wonder what it is about building a, a home or a workspace that attracts so many visual people. I wonder too. That's a, that's a funny one. Um, uh, in film school, you know, a lot of a lot of people have the like, should I go to film school question? Um, yeah. And I, I feel like I have a over if, if anyone's listened to all of these fucking podcasts, they probably know what my position is. But um, <laughs> I was wondering what uh, value you pulled from um, the two years in film school that you spent. And then I'll, I'll tell you just to not I just don't want to color your opinion before we uh, no. get in there. OK, but, for sure. Um, so, yeah. So so since I. I didn't have access to, you know, living in New York, it's, it's really rare to stumble into um, filmmakers or anyone in, in crews really. So occasionally, very rarely you would see, you know, a set happening in some city street. But wow. I didn't have access. Yeah. <laughs> but I, <laughs> Every time. I <laughs> but I, wouldn't, I didn't have any access to that industry. And so really I thought that the only way was to just, you know, go to a film school and just kind of figure it out that way. Um, and for me personally, those two years that I spent in film school were just like incredibly valuable. Um, you know, the, it, it, the school used to have a structure where it was like, you know, you're a freshman, so you can only use this, uh, level of equipment sophomore. Mm -hmm. Now you can use this junior, senior. Now you can get access to the big, you know, film cameras, the SR2s and all this stuff. But, you know, I came in when... There was a new film chair. His name is Richard D'Angelo. Um, and he just kind of reimagined the whole system and said, you know, you're a freshman here, have it all, you know, use everything. So now I had access to like the Fisher Dolly as, as a freshman, you know, maybe responsible, but no, but still I had all these <laughs> tools to my disposal that I could just use and play with and learn and just like mess up a bunch of times, incredibly valuable stuff. Um, and I, I thank him for that. Um, and then, you know, and then the people that I met that are still friends to this day, um, relationships that I built in college that carried on into the real world and, and into the industry and just kind of like, it just, these two years just, you know, introduced me to a ton of incredible equipment, incredible people, you know, it, it broadened my, my view on films and how to speak about films and how to make them. And so it just really set me up. Um, in a, in a, in a, you know, gave me the base level, set me up for the real world. And uh, I, it's complete, yeah, super, super valuable for me. Um, but I know there's this, this, you know, there's a debate whether, whether you need it or not, you know, because you could take that money you spent on film school and just start making films of your own, buy a camera, go out and shoot. Um, and that's, that's totally true. You can do that, um, especially if you have mentors or people that you can, that you have access to that you can ask questions and things, you know, people you can bounce ideas of. If you have a community, um, then perhaps that's a route you can take. But for me personally, I didn't have that. And so going to film school was just, yeah, it was super valuable. Yeah. I, uh, so I actually fully agree with you. I think, uh, uh, film school isn't, is an incredible place to, like you said, build a community, build, uh, you find people that you're going to end up working with. I mean, I've said this before, like at least 10 of my friends and actually more, I'm finding more of them, uh, from college 
so the initial 10, we all moved to LA at the same time. Right. Oh, wow. And then, and now I'm st- uh, running into more and more friends from college. I went to Arizona state. There's the, the you know, 58,000 kids at my school. And we went and saw Batman the other night and a buddy of mine, I haven't seen in 12 years, just plops down next to us. And we're like, Oh, what's up, bud? You know, that kind of thing. Incredible. incredible. Um, but there's also something to be said that you mentioned that I think is really important. Uh, you said it more or less, which is like building um, the filmmaker holistically instead of, cause I think the, the, the idea of, Oh, you don't need film school comes from people thinking as long as you can make an image, you're good. And it's right. like, no, you do need to know like the history of film, other shit. The other thing too, is like just being in college teaches you other stuff that you Absolutely. take into filmmaking. That's absolutely true. You know, I think going to I, where I went to school, it was just completely outside of the community that I grew up in. So now I'm thrusted into an environment that's completely unfamiliar. Um, and so even through that and interacting with people that are different from the community that I came from and just had different, you know, just a different outlook on life and just a different culture. It was just it was it was wonderful to experience that. And I think that contributed to my growth as well. So you're, you're yeah, absolutely right. Totally. So you, uh, you, you grad, you, um, drop out of film school and you start, uh, going off and making short films, music videos and stuff with your friends. What was that, uh, sort of, uh, what did that look like in, in the sense that's a, what a open-ended shitty question. (laughs) What I mean is like, you know, how long, how long were you doing that for? Like what, what were the things that you learned? Um, maybe some of the lessons that you still to this day, like the, you know, can point to that time and go like that's thank God that happened or whatever. Oh man, huge, huge, huge moment in my, in my, you know, in my early career and just, just really, you're, yeah, there's some things that happened that kind of shaped who I am today. And, and so I remember during my sophomore year, the year that I was going to drop out, I remember, you know, I was, I was, I actually did buy a camera while I was in um, college. I, I had the, uh, the Panasonic HVX 200. It yeah. was like, you know, mini TV tapes, but I think you could, you could also put like a, a P2 card in there. And it was like, yep, kind of like yep, a yep. thing. And so, so I was, go, I was, was going to college and I just found opportunities where I could do some work outside of college as well, where it was just, I don't know, filming some little documentary or little thing for some local person. Cause you know, I had a camera set and I was going to film school. So that was, you know, it was, you know, it's a thing. And so I was, I was doing some jobs outside of film school and it started to become more frequent and more frequent. And I remember I had a directing teacher and, uh, you know, the school just, it doesn't just focus on cinematography, it teaches everything. Yeah. And my directing teacher, she goes, you know, I think you're not coming to class as much anymore. And I think, I think you should just drop out. And I remember feeling like, you know, no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta stay in college. You know, my folks, they want me to, to graduate, you know, this, this would be important for them. Ultimately, I, I just, I just, um, I took her advice. But um, so as soon as I, you know, left, left college i was working on a lot of music videos um a ton of low paid music videos in new york i mean we're talking about like sometimes they were they were you know freebies sometimes they were like a hundred bucks here and there you know just like little chunk change um we've all done them yeah but, yeah but you know you know so it was a lot of that a lot of like doing like day in the life following these artists around going to different cities and just like that, little mini dots. Yeah. Oh, I hate that so much. The fucking, Hey man, why don't you follow me around with your camera for a week? How much yeah. money do you have? Uh, 50 bucks. I'll give you lunch though. You're like, Stop. Oh man. <laughs> you used to, like it used to always be like, yeah, we can't pay, but we can give you a meal and credit, you know? <laughs> oh so, yeah. The exposure. Yeah. yeah. The exposure. <laughs> So it was a lot of that, a lot of just like working on little to no pay jobs, music videos, just kind of like cracking away, cracking away. You know, my folks, they didn't really understand it. They were like, you know, why are you working for free? <laughs> you know, what's going on? They tried to convince me to stop doing it, to get a job, do something else. Um, but, I, you know, I stuck with it. Um, and then, you know, I, then I remember like I did now fast forward a couple of years and, you know, a few mu- music video, a bunch of music videos in. And I remember waking up in a hotel room in Atlanta uh, the morning of a, of a shoot and thinking to myself, man, I am not happy. This is not, I'm not into this at all. And 
I made a decision. I was like, all right, I'm going to stop doing music videos because I'm just not feeling it. And I don't, I don't want to fall out of love with what I do. Right. And so I stopped doing music videos and, and was just focusing more on short films. Um, and, you know, uh, and there was a lot at the time, there was a lot of short films that were coming my way. And what was great about that is that I could really focus on, you know, narrative filmmaking, building visuals to support the story and just like honing in on, on that aspect of it and the continuity of light between scenes and scenes and, the, you know, and, 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 the, and the continuity of the aesthetic throughout the film and just kind of like slowly building this philosophy that I have now. Um, but even with that, even with music video, uh, with uh, short films, you know, they don't pay well. So you just have to do everything, you know, everything that comes your way is to sustain a living. Um, and then, you know, and then during that, you know, uh, you know, features started to come my way. Um, I remember this, this is like a very like pinnacle moment in my, in my, in my early, you know, my early times where a feature came my way and, I didn't really, you know, connect with the story or the script. The conditions in which we were going to film this this um, this feature weren't the best, and there was really nothing tying me to it except for the fact that I needed to get I needed money. I needed to, you know, to get paid really uh, to sustain this this continuation of this career. Um, and so I, I took the film uh, just for a paycheck. Worst mistake that I've ever made, but. Actually, I, I don't regret it because now it, it, it with that, I learned that I, I, I'm, I, I don't choose films anymore for paychecks at all. You know, my, my whole philosophy now is, you know, I want to preserve the purity of narrative making, of telling stories as an art form and not let it get muddied with, with money. And it's part of the reason why I don't own a camera either or gear for that matter, nothing, because I want to go in as like you're hiring me for the visuals that I can create. I want to go in without any like baggage, you know, I own this camera. So now you have to use this camera because I own this camera or I own these lenses. So here you have to use these lenses because I own this lens. So there's now I, I just a clean slate. You're, you're, I'm coming into this project pure and I'm, you know, to service it in the way that it needs to be serviced. And so that experience, um, you know, working on that film and, and I, I was just had a miserable time because I, I really just didn't connect with any aspect of it at all. And the thing about it, the funny thing about it is that, you know, the money wasn't even that great. So I just did it because I really needed it. Yeah. Um, so that informed the choices that I make now. It's like, you know, I no longer choose to make films for money. Uh, what I do instead now to kind of balance the books, you know, I, I just commercials are perfect, you know, so, you know, they're uh, low risk. You can experiment with new gear. Some, you know, most of the times there really isn't a deep emotional uh, connection to the material that you're shooting, especially right. if it's like a hair product. You know, there's no. There's I no love Chevrolet so much. You know. <laughs> right. Right. So it's it's a it's a beautiful balance because now I get to go and shoot these commercials for a few days uh, here and there, different cities, different things, meet new people, try new techniques, work with different directors, sustain a living that way. And then now I have the ability to say yes and no to specific narrative projects. Now I can look at a project and, and read the script, talk to the director, understand the approach and make a decision whether or not I'm the right fit for it versus back in the day when I was first starting out, I would take everything and, and so, and, and this, this is going back to the whole music video thing. When I woke up in Atlanta and I, and I realized I have to stop doing this um, because I was falling out of love with it. And then the same, I took this feature, I was miserable. Okay, I have to stop doing this because I don't want to fall out of love of what, you know, what I love, you know, of, of this, this craft that, I, that I'm into. Um, and so I make these choices, these things happen in my life that kind of in, inform these choices and all of it to kind of just preserve the purity of, of just telling stories yeah, no, it's, it, uh, you had a handful of really, uh, good things to touch on in there. Um, first off, uh, I, I mentioned this in the last interview I did, but, uh, David Blaine actually has a great going back to the magic thing. David Blaine has a great quote where, or whatever he said, which was basically, he doesn't agree to anything unless he would do it for a dollar. If he wouldn't do it for a for $1, he's not going to do it. So he's turned down like million dollar projects just because he's like, I don't, I wouldn't do it for one. Why would I do it for a million? You know, Amazing. um, 
What a so beautiful kinda, quote. Yeah, and so that's kind of been sitting. Well, I just read it three days ago, so I really it's been it's been on my mind because uh, it is like something that is something that people should consider, you know. And you can do well. So that brings me to the next part, which is um, how do you uh, balance the the commercial world with the um, uh, narrative world? If in in other words, uh, how how are you picking up these commercials, and how are you picking up? Uh, these narratives and how do you balance that schedule wise? Yeah. So, you know, it, there are times for sure where the commercials and the narrative will kind of conflict. I'm actually dealing with that now where I have a, a few commercial offers and, and, a, and, a, and a narrative feature that I really want to do as well. So it's just kind of figuring out the balance there. But, you know, as far as like these commercials, you know, they, a lot of it has come through previous relationships um, word of mouth, really, and just outreach. You know, I I would see, you know, sometimes I would see really cool things that were made on social media or wherever, Vimeo. And I would just like reach out to directors and and look to to just have a conversation and to to get some coffee or to meet or, you know, just just showing genuine appreciation um to their craft and what they what they would do, what they what they the project that they that they did. And so a lot of it is that just outreaching, um, you know, word of mouth, uh, you know, previous connections, you know, there's a level of work that also comes through my agency, um, which is really nice. And then, you know, same thing with narrative, narrative, you know, previous relationships, word of mouth and a combination of, of that with the agency as well. Um, and it's, it's just been really a really great balance, truly, um, you know. Yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. No, but. it, it well because uh, that's kind of where uh, I I personally would like to be. I'd lo- I'd love to be doing commercials and and finding time for narratives. At the moment, most of my stuff is a uh, sort of corporate gigs, um, which is you know pays the bills certainly. Yeah, I know for sure. Not sure. N- not entirely great. Not that I commercials just seem more fun, but um, yeah. I've had a few people ask. I guess me or we conversations have popped up around the agency thing. How, how important has that been to your career? And uh, at what point in your career did that sort of come about? Yeah. You know, when I was, when I was younger, I was super impatient and I thought I need an agent, I need an agent now. And I would like research the top cinematography agencies and kind of make a short list of like the ones that I would like to reach out to. And, and thought that that was the thing that would take my career to the next level. I thought that I really needed an agency at that time. Hmm. Um, and I was completely wrong. You know, it, it just doesn't work that way. And um, I think that, you know, agents should come to you, you know, because they agents do a really good job at, at going to the festivals, looking for new talent, um, seeing who's doing what, what's going on. And, and they'll eventually reach out to you. You know, you keep doing great work. You keep being consistent you keep being true to yourself and the work that you do, you'll eventually knock on your door. And that's kind of what happened to me. And, you know, they just showed genuine interest in the work that I was doing. And, you know, and I think that, you know, signing, signing with an agency has what it's done for me. It's that now I'm, I, I have access to, you know, other collaborators and other directors or other projects that I might not have had, I had access to if I were just like, you know, with, without that, you know, you know, my agents send me scripts here and there um, that I wouldn't have heard of if they hadn't sent me the script. And so that gives me the opportunity to to read the script, see how I connect, meet with the filmmakers. And that just kind of just broadens um, my exposure a bit, you know, even if it doesn't work out on that script that I received now that, you know, they remember me, they remember that conversation we had, that that meeting that we had. And and I think what it does is just kind of, it, it expands my reach. Um, and when I was hungry for an agent when I was younger, it actually, I reflect on that now, it, it really wasn't the right time for me. Like I, but I was just impatient. I wanted to just go right away. Um, but I realize now that, you know, the best thing to do really, uh, if I could speak to my younger self was, and in which is kind of what I did was to just continue working on the craft and continue polishing, continue, continue improving, continue becoming a better version of yourself. And eventually uh, that'll, you know, the, the agents will manifest for sure. Yeah. The, uh, 
another kind of related question that, that has come up a lot is uh, how important is a reel and are reels dead? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're first starting out and you don't have a lot of projects, a reel is important for sure. Um, I had, you know, many different reels and I, you know, you know, early on, it was always like refreshing the reel, 2000, whatever reel, 2000, this reel. And, um, and it would always, you'd always update it and, you know, every year. And at the time, you know, that was the thing to do because, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of projects to show. Um, and so I would take the best shots of everything that I've done, put it together. And, and that, you know, with that, people get a sense of the kind of stuff that I do. And, and um, that could start the conversation. Eventually, um, as I started doing more commercials, more narrative projects, it became less about creating a reel and more about, okay, here's a, a trailer to this piece. Here's a, here's a teaser to this piece. You know, here's, uh, here's the actual full commercial spot. And so you know, you go on my website now and it's, you know, trailers on trailers on trailers or the full, you know, music video or the full um, commercial. And I think, I think that's a, that's a better representation of a cinematographer's consistency, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause then, you know, you give access to producers and directors to see consistency throughout a piece. So if they're watching a two minute trailer, they can see now different environments, different scenes, different, you know, moments throughout this narrative piece. And they can get a better sense of, you know, your voice um, versus a reel, you know, you're selecting the best shots. And, and sometimes they, they may, once they see a reel, they may want to see more. They may want to see, you know, the full piece. Um, but I don't knock reels because I, I used to do them all the time. And and I think that if, if you, if you're still building your portfolio, you're still accumulating works then a reel is i think is the is for sure the way to go if you're first starting out sure you know you mentioned uh your website I, I gave it a quick peek before we spoke and i noticed you had a segment um with photography in it and were those yeah. paintings as well or were those photos of textures <laughs> yeah uh paintings uh, actually so uh talk to me about your uh photo and painting work then like where did that come about is that a, is that a newer um skill you've acquired so photography was always kind of there, you know, it was, it was, it was always there. Um, you know, I'll, I'll always bring my film camera, uh, on a set and what do you have a, a, a too many, too many. No, I have, enough. yeah, but I'll tell you, I have, um, you know, uh, my, my, I think my, my first film camera was a Canon AE one 35 millimeter classic. Loved it, man. I recommend I can recommend everyone to shoot film because it, it just, it um, allows you to just work on your restraint and just, you know, you start thinking about things a bit more deeply where the versus like a digital camera, you're just kind of like, just, you know, shooting everything and anything. And so shooting on film just allowed me to just really be more specific and deliberate about the, my shots. Um, you know, I have a, a digital camera as well now, but I still take the same film approach where I'm specific about the shots that I take. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll frame up a shot and not hit the trigger because it just yeah. didn't, it didn't feel right. Um, so I have that. I have, uh, you know, I have two medium format cameras, um, a Yashica and a Roloflex. Um, and I have a large format camera. Um, oh, wow. a, uh, yeah. Four by five crown graphics. Um, that one's a little tough. You know, a lot of my stuff, I love doing. Oh, you don't take street. that for street photography. <laughs> That's the thing. I would love to. I would love to take it for street photography because that's like what really excites me is just hitting the streets and finding stories unfold out on the streets and and and, and capturing that story. Um, at this stage, I'm not too into studio photography, um, but I don't knock it. You know, some people doing some beautiful studio photography work. A friend of mine actually, uh, he spent some time in India, and he also has a large format camera, and he went on the street with his large format camera. But he had a liaison with him that he could so, so that would talk to the locals and ask if their picture could be taken. And, you know, he would throw him some money. And so he was just he was able to capture some beautiful scenes and textures out in the streets of India in, in, uh, in Chennai um, with his large format camera, which is incredible. That's like that's I would love to do that. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so so I'm always I always have a, my, my film camera with me and, you know, some of the stuff you'll see on my website, you know, some of it is just actors between takes. 
Um, yeah, that 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 uh, collection is really uh, beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I I always have the camera strapped around me whenever I see an opportunity. I'll I'll race up to the actor and and just kind of like find a moment and, and capture that. Uh, it's beautiful. It's just such an. It's kind of like uh, you know, in between the takes, it's just so intimate because they're usually to themselves and they're just in their heads. And I kind of like try to sneak in very delicately and and try to try to find a nice moment there. Um, the painting that's actually that actually came up. That's a new development, really. Um, you know, during the lockdown, uh, you know, we were stuck at home for three and a half months, maybe more, and <clears throat> I didn't have a, a creative outlet. You know, I. Yeah, I would watch films, you know, every day, um, but I, I didn't have, I, I couldn't go out and make them. And that was, that was typically my release, you know, um, or I would go out and shoot, you know, street photography. That was also a release. And I didn't have any of that, you know, and I didn't want to do the technical work of just editing all this photo, all the photos that I had to edit, you know, that just became stale and uninteresting. And I remember sitting on my couch one day and I'm just like weird, but I thought I was going mad just visions of color just started popping in my head and like in shapes and weird stuff. I don't know what was going on, man. And then I thought, okay, I guess the only way to really just express what's what I'm seeing is, is to just get some paper, some canvases and some acrylics and just start, start painting. And I found it to be incredibly therapeutic. Um, the perfect creative release. It was, it was, it was incredible. Those, those three months of just painting. Um, and it's a, uh, I try to to do that, uh, to do more of it here. Now, now that the industry's picked up and everyone's working, I try to find time to continue that habit. Um, it's a little tough, but but those those three months painting those pieces is truly, truly was a special time. Yeah, the, are they, I am they, not a trained painter, by the way. <laughs> that, was, <thank> you. <laughs> that was my first time trying something, but it was, for me, what it, all it really was was an expression of self and color and what I was feeling and, and what I was seeing and. And yeah, I know it was a beautiful time. Yeah, I, I, I often, I, a buddy of mine's a painter and I often wish I, because there are like shapes in my head saying that kind of you're saying that I wish I could articulate like that. But uh, I also shoot, I have a RZ67, so that's not oh, a street nice. photography uh, camera, <laughs> but I have a Nikon F2, so that's a little easier, but I, I do love yeah. medium format um, photography. But uh, uh, where was I going to go with this? Oh, you, you should mentioned- take- uh, do what you should paint man if you feel it and if you and if you have these things that you want to express just get a canvas get some paint and just I go do for it next to a michaels perfect <laughs> there you go <laughs> um, same here actually. oh no shit yeah. uh you had, you had mentioned the the lockdown it, during my time uh in the lockdown i became a colorist because oh, people had a bunch of shit that they needed that they had like finished but they just didn't have any colors. So I started doing that, which was great for me as a cinematographer. Cause now I can, you know, especially doing the many hats production that I do. Um, yeah. you know, it's a value add for clients and stuff like that. And, uh, kind of swinging into the film that you're here to talk about the whole film shot beautifully, but I kept okay. noticing this color thing that I was like, ah, that's, that's the thing I'm, I, I know that really looks like that Jill Bogdanovich color that I love. And then I go through the credits and I was like, fuck, there she is. Like, Oh, wow. I'll have to tell her that next time I see her, she'll, she'll be, yeah, she'll love to hear that. I, she, yeah, her, her color work is, is, uh, absolutely some of my favorites. There's this weird, like creaminess and in the whites and this like blue light that I have yet to replicate. Uh, yeah. not that I want to like copy her, but I just want to know how to do it just so I know what it is. Um, cause it's, 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 uh, I really love her work, but she, uh, she complimented your photography beautifully. Oh, Oh, great. I mean, yeah, no, like she, she, you know, one of the things the director and I, Mo McRae, you know, we like to give people the ability to express themselves as well. You know, it's never like, this is what we want, do this and that's it. And even with Jill at Company 3, it was a super collaborative effort. You know, we went in for the first few hours just talking about philosophy. You know, we had references, you know, there were things that we were interested in and, and through these conversations and through Jill's experience, we were able to just kind of like develop the look and she, and she, and she went for it. You know, she, she put a a lot of herself into it as well. It wasn't just Mo and I saying, do this. She was totally part of the team on equal footing. And the three of us just kind of developed 
you know, what we see now. Um, and yeah, no, she's incredibly talented. And, and, and the, the one thing too, Mo, he, he always said he wanted the film to kind of have its own aesthetic. He didn't want it to necessarily, you know, look like any specific film where you can say, Oh, that, that, you know, a lot of nothing looks like this. It looks like that. Totally. Um, he wanted it to kind of just feel like unique where, where the film itself becomes a reference for someone else, you know, and, and hopefully we achieve that. So we'll see. Yeah. I, I, I uh, so what's funny is the um, studio or whoever sent me the film this morning. So about 15 minutes before you got on, I finished it. So, I, oh. so when we sat down, I was still kind of in this weird headspace. Where I was like, all right, I need to focus. Like, what was I going to ask? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's a great, it's a really great movie. Uh, I, I'm sure they're going to love it at South by, um, have you done any other interviews for this film yet? Uh, just, yes. I, with light gear, I, uh, just a, a written interview. Okay. So we'll talk. I, I so you're using light mats or did they did just interview you? Mat. Yeah, they just interviewed me. I, I think we had a couple of light mats. Yeah, we actually did have a couple of light mats on, um, but that wasn't the, 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 uh, the reason for the interview. They just like, yeah, they just hit me up and wanted to talk. Got, gotcha. So the reason I asked all those questions is one, uh, the light mats and the uh, Titan tubes seem to be in every yeah. DP's kit. Yeah. Um, did you use the Titan tubes on this? We for sure use or the Titan tubes. tubes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, dude, I got to call a stare and have them to sponsor me because we talk about them every week. <laughs> Listen, if you get a free kit, you know, that's that's the way to do it, man. <laughs> I wish. I would but, take no. that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, we used, we actually used the, 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 uh, the Titans on, so at the, at the, there's, there's the main house where James and Vanessa lives, you know, there's at the house, there's just like, just outside of the windows, there's just like beautiful, like waterfall outside of the dining, um, dining room window, big, big, tall windows. And there's this waterfall on the other side and just like a small little pond of water, very small. And so, so basically we just got some underwater housings for these Titans and we put them underwater and we can just, we didn't have to deal with like cables or anything like that. It was just wireless and it was, it was just perfect. Yeah. Um, and we would, we would sprinkle these tubes out of sight. You know, a lot of things, a lot with this, you know, we had a, a 17 minute one -er That uh, So that's why I asked if you had been interviewed okay. about this before, because I would assume everyone's going to ask you about the one -er, but if I'm the first, let's talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> let's do it, man. Yeah. Oh man. So, wow. 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 Okay. So Mo always had this one in, in, in mind. Like he always wanted the, the, the film to, to open in a one -er. And, you know, there were a lot of folks trying to talk him out of it. You know, it was like, Oh, you need coverage. You need coverage, but kudos to him for, for sticking with it. And, and just like not, not allowing to be swayed and just kind of like, this is what he wanted and we're going to find a way to make it happen. <clears throat> and, you know, we're in the house, right? So, we're dealing with two actors in one house. Fortunately, the house was, was big and it was a nice looking house. So there was ways to hide things. Um, and so you're, we're, we're following, you know, we're following James, one character walking through many parts of the house. Eventually he sits next to his wife and they're having a conversation, watching the TV, watching TV. And then they start to get into it and they move to another part of the house. And it just becomes this dance of now we're in multiple areas of the house. We want it to be in a wonder, right? Mo just wants this like fluid, uninterrupted, unpredictable um, feeling, yeah. and and so now we're we're, we're thinking, and we didn't want to we didn't want any hidden cuts or anything like that. So we're thinking about okay, so we have to light this kind of in a three sixty way with very specific blocking, specific areas where um, the lighting would be the most flattering, or the most interesting, or the most dark for the moment. Um, so, you know, we did a lot of like overhead rigging, little, little points of light here and there that we could hide out of frame. Um, you know, we did the one on steady cam, you know, shout out to Aaron Gant, who's an incredible, 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 um, um, steady cam operator and just operator in general. Um, yeah, 17 minutes is a long time to yeah. be on a steady cam. Oh, man. Trooper, trooper. And I'm going to, there's another thing about Aaron too. That's incredible. Um, and also shout, shout out to the, the focus pillar, Aaron Chung, who, who just like kept it sharp yeah. throughout. Incredible. I, I, don't, I don't know how people do that job. It's such a, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. Um, and so, and so, there, so we have the 17 minute wonder, we're figuring out how to light it. You know, we're, we're, we're getting into that mode. And then I am in pre-production with Mo at the office. 
And, you know, we're just having philosophical conversations and we're dissecting the 17 minute wonder, right? Because we didn't want to just like document this moment. We wanted things to be specific, right? We wanted calculated decisions, where the camera is going to be at which moment, who is it going to be on and looking at the scene and how it flows and who is the scene more important? Uh, who's more important in this moment of the scene? And, and do we want to see this person's face or is it better to not see the reaction of this person? And so we went line by line, moment by moment, making those decisions, you know, <clears throat> there's a moment that, you know, James is saying some stuff that Vanessa just doesn't agree with, doesn't want to hear. And the camera shifts to her and we're on her face and, and, and seeing how she's reacting to what he's saying. Um, and so we were making a lot of deliberate choices like that, a lot of philosophical choices like that. And through these conversation, um, Mo, there's a moment in the script where, in the scene where things become incredibly tense, like super, super tense. And Mo looks over to me and goes, so, you know, what if, what if we went handheld here? <laughs> I was like, wondering about that. Yeah. So that is a yeah. handoff? Oh, it's a handoff. Oh, um, I thought he was just no, giving her no. one of those. It's a handoff and it's a, like this crazy operation. And I I kind of like freeze for a second, right? As he tells me this. And I'm just like looking at him because I don't I don't really know what to say yet. And I and I said, I didn't and the first thing I said, let's call Aaron, you know, our uh, yeah. Aaron Gant. Let's go, let's let's see what he said. So because I, I totally agreed with him. I was like, you know, going handheld in this moment is is the right call. It's it's just perfect for, for what's happening in the scene. Um, we also didn't want to do a hidden cut. We wanted it to be a real uh, transition to handheld. So we called Aaron. <clears throat> we told him what we're looking for. He said, give me a couple of days. He came back with the, you know, with, with some ideas. Him and our key grip was also extraordinary. Um, Philip Collins. He, yeah, they, they both came up with a solution that allowed us to, to go from Aaron's, you know, steady cam rig to me on the easy rig transition handoff to continue this, the, the last few minutes of the scene in handheld. So pretty much, you know, Aaron does, you know, I think it's like 15 minutes of the scene, um, steady cam and we get to a specific point and Philip and I are hiding in the corner. I have my easy rig and I'm holding on to it. He's behind me. We're hiding somewhere. And we know when we need to, you know, and then the cue comes and, and we, we, we sneak up behind um, Aaron on the steady cam. And Phil has this like two handed operation. So Aaron is holding on to the stem of the steady cam to, to keep it steady. The scene, by the way, the scene is still going on. There's still dialogue, right. there's still conversation, there's still stuff. And we have to do this in a delicate way so the actors don't get, you know, we don't take them out of the zone. Um, cause again, no cuts. So their performances have to be on point. We have to be on point. Um, so Aaron is holding on to the stem to keep it steady. Phil is going for this quick release plate on the, on the, on the slide of the, of the, of the steady cam. At the same time, his other hand is holding on to my, to the, to the connector of my easy rig. So he connects me on the easy rig, pulls the, the quick release plate at this, at, the, at this time I'm holding on to the camera. So now we have six hands holding on to, to the camera, to the steady cam, doing a bunch of stuff. So it just looks like a six handed operation. And eventually the camera gets released. I'm holding on to the camera. Um, Phil and Aaron just kind of like trickle away and I continue the scene in handheld. And now I'm pushing forward on them and getting really close, really intimate, subtle shake and just kind of like bouncing between the two, finding these moments. And it was just, yeah, it was, it was a, a really um, a powerful, like, just collaboration. Um, everyone involved, too, was like, you know, the, the actors crushed it, you know, the, the camera team, incredible, you know, from, from Aaron Chung just keeping everything sharp to, you know, everyone else on the camera team just keeping uh, our wireless signals, you know, connected and everyone is able to see, you know, that, that's also... Hiding, yeah. hiding, you know, yeah, hiding that and, and not seeing it in the frame and keeping everything connected is, is incredible. You know, even the art department, they had a lot of balancing they needed to do too, like moving tables out of the way, bringing it back in. So there was a lot of stuff happening. Um, sound department, I mean, that's also incredible. You know, they stayed out of reflections. They stayed out of, you know, it was unbelievable, unbelievable um, experience. There's a lot of shiny stuff in that room. 
Yeah. Which yeah, you use beautifully, by the way. Oh, Great reflection you. plays or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we actually utilized, yeah, yeah, as you saw, um, played a lot with reflections and just like, you know, a lot of this really was just Mo and I finding, um, you know, trying to incorporate, you know, the space and, and, and using philosophical choices on, on what the characters might be feeling and how, how we can use the space to reflect some of that. Um, but, but yeah, the Steadicam handoff and handheld and 17 minute wonder, that was a special thing with all departments coming together. It was beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I, I knew it was so had a few thoughts on it first. Like you could, you could clip that 17 minute chunk. Cause it is just the intro, then credits go, you know, or the yeah. opening credits. Um, yeah. that could be the promo for the film. You know, I like, <laughs> because the, what made me think that was, at about the 10 minute mark, I went, wait, is this a one Like, I, it, I, cause it just really, you know, brings you in. Uh, and I was thinking the joke in my head that I made was like, I wonder if you could sneak this in before a movie as like the trailer and just play it right. and see how long it takes until the audience goes, Oh, wait a minute. Hold, what's happening. Like, you know? Right. right. Um, well, I'm, glad, I'm really glad you said that because you know, the, the fact that, you know, it, it, maybe it took you a little longer to to notice that it was a wonder because it, it just things started to click and things were working and, yeah. and maybe there wasn't, you know, yeah, a testament to the actors and just to, to, to the, the, the choices of angles. I think maybe that kept things a bit more engaging. Well, yeah, it's I mean, the acting is fantastic, uh, but also it, it's it doesn't draw attention itself until I think they leave the couch, in which case you're like, oh, right. wait a minute, there's more movement than. Than right. we were expecting, but uh, yeah, it's just really, uh, really well executed and really sets the tone for the film um, in a in a perfect way. Uh, and then kicks, you know, it's the it actually it did make me think of like when we were in film school and they were like, oh, you got make sure that you know we we're shooting on DV, you know, we got an XL two or a DVX one hundred, you know, you got to add production value. And I remember right. my buddy my buddy Smalls had a crane. And we abuse or a, a jib arm, and we abused the shit out of that thing. Oh and so, my goodness. And I so had the same situation. I had a person in school that owned a Jimmy Jib arm and we'd always yep. use it. So great. Go ahead. Everything. Yeah. So when, when it went from the one to the helicopter shot, I was like production value. You know, I did the super eight <laughs> production value. Um, talk to me about uh, kind of your approach because the, the uh, to lighting, because the film is very um, stylized, but in, an, in a sort of natural way, it doesn't feel uh -huh lit. Um, and I think it's a look that a lot of people, uh, as you said, uh, uh, are kind of going for, or, or will potentially want to emulate. Um, not that I'm trying to give, have you give away the secret sauce necessarily, but, uh, you know, what was your approach to getting that, that sort of look and, and keeping it consistent? I think, I think for me personally, I love the, the natural style, you know, I love when, you know, I think and it's, 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 it's project to project, you know, there are some projects like one that I shot recently that that was more expressive. And so there's more deliberate um, choices there, but for the most part, I like this natural feeling, you know, motivated feeling and, and going into this, to this film, it was like, it was a two part thing really is, is giving the sense of just like a natural environment. Um, but also lighting it in a way where the actors kind of had freedom to kind of move around, you know, and, and, and to, to, to improvise to a certain extent, um, you know, so we would light it in a way where they had the, the ability to move, right? So I, I don't want to say 360 lighting, but it, there, there was an element of like, you know, rigging most things overhead and out of sight, um, you know, very soft lighting. And then we would add some pops of color here and there. We would add some, some, um, you know, some negative film behind camera and in places where the camera wouldn't see, just to add a level, a, a level of shape and contrast to it as well. Um, but for the most part, it was, you know, the choice was, we want this to feel natural. We want this to feel, mm, uh, what's the right word, unassuming in a way where um, it doesn't bring a lot of attention to itself. Um, and, but at the same time, giving the actors space to, to move around. So, so we did have like some 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 rigging points overhead where we would have like units here and there and and just like diffusion to just keep, have this like soft light coming down and um, rarely rarely had units on the ground except for a handful of moments in the house where 
actors were like specific and deliberate sitting down having a conversation about you know certain things and and then and, and in there then we would like you know have units on the ground and shape it a different way just to elicit a different feeling but for the most part most of our lights came from above and that was the luxury of this house is that you know it was big spacious it was it allowed us to treat it kind of like a studio where we can create rigging points and have units up there and just kind of adjust them as we needed just use um, some spreaders yeah spreaders um uh we had a rigging team come into the house the you know the day before we needed to be in there to set those points up for us set our, our units up <clears throat> and then we would just tweak as we needed um some of the units were on wireless, which was great. Um, quick adjustments there, but yeah, it was just a lot of spreaders, a lot of you know, just uh, creating a grid essentially in certain rooms. Yeah, it's it's really is a, a very uh, the word modern comes to mind, but that almost feels uh, reductive in some way. Uh, but mm-hmm. it ju- it just has this very uh, good. You know, I don't know what the budget was for this, but it looks as high budget as any film you would see. You know, um, and be- just because um, it's by South by, I assumed it was lower budget. You know, uh, yeah, no, not for as sure, an insult. Sure. Not as an insult. I mean, no, that is a compliment. No. I and I and I and I and I feel that as a compliment too, because we took. You know, we we had. You know, just we didn't have a lot of money to make this happen, and so a lot of people came into this with the idea of making something great. You know, and it wasn't about a paycheck again. It was about the story, the people involved and, and doing something really special and great. And, you know, Mo does a really, really good job at casting people. Yeah. Not oh, just everyone's actors. perfect in this film. Yeah. And, and not just actors, but to, to casting people behind the scenes, you know, his department, the people, you know, from, from different departments and just the collaborators that are brought onto this, you know, everyone just had the same mindset of making something great. And uh, it's great to hear that the film looks expensive because um, that's that's a super compliment. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it really it it's it draws you in and it and it looks good and it, it's got all the things that uh, and the script's good obviously, uh, but it's got all the things that just you know like I said I I literally just watched it so I haven't quite had the time to <laughs> to like <laughs> analyze. I, I hit pause on the credits and then walked over here to talk to you. Oh nice, um, nice. But uh, was what was your shooting pack on? Just like uh, was Alexa. I assume. Yeah. Alexa mini. Um, and you know, we had a, the, our lens, our glass was the, some, some old cook S2 pancros, some oh, specific. Wow. Yeah. Some specific ones that Mo really liked. Um, and yeah, it was a pretty, pretty basic package. No, no, no funny. No, no, um, no little, uh, nothing really extra, I guess, <laughs> for lack of better words, but it was just a very basic package. With a really nice set of glass. Yeah. Any filtration at all? No, zero. No filters. No. I mean, just just your occasional rotopola, you know, outside and and sure. And N and D here and there, but you know, no filters at all. Um, you know, because there's there's a level of uh, texture that we like to add um, after the fa- in, you know in color. Totally. And so I feel I felt like you know keeping it as clean as possible will give us the most range to do that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I used to be a big filter guy, big diffusion guy. I feel like a lot of people uh, Me too, man. or are. But recently I've been, especially with um, full frame cameras, I've been really starting to, to push back on filtration. A, because you can add the texture in post. But B, um, I feel like especially in full frame, like it, it that higher physical resolution kind of smooths things out. It's not as sharp as digital seems to be. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting... Um, Interesting. One of, one of my first, uh, actually, I think this was my second feature film a very long time ago, over 10 years ago. It um, <clears throat> actually worked with Robert England. It was, uh, it was, it was, it, oh, wow. Amazing. Freddy. Yeah. Amazing to work with him. Um, Kruger for anyone listening, not just Freddie, someone, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not just some guy named Freddie. Um, it was amazing to work with him, man. But um, the film, the film actually is, it's, it's, it's not a good film, right? not to trash talk, but it ended up being like, a BC horror kind of thing, you know, but it was, it was good for me in the beginning ages to kind of like work on this and kind of like wet the palette. But I remember I shot on the red at that time. Mm. And I remember like stacking it with filters. Like, I mean, like stacking it. I'm trying to remember what I had, but it was like Hollywood black magic mixed with some softening filter. And then, so now we have, yeah. So it's like a double stack (laughs) of softening. 
and then I shot wide open and then I would haze up most of the environments. So it was just like, Oh man. Yeah. Was this the MX? Uh, this like was the red this, one? no, this was when the, what was it? The, the Epic what was the first one that looked like a square or box. Uh, yeah. The Epic, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It was when the Epic third just came out and um, we shot on that. And actually, no, this might've been the, no, this was the Epic for sure. No, this was the MX. Definitely the MX, the big cannon. Um, and, and yeah, I just stack filters, but now, now I just, I, I don't use those filters at all anymore. Just, you know, not that I don't use them anymore, very, very rarely. And it's project dependent. And, and the most that I would ever go is like an eighth of something, you know, yeah. it would just be, and maybe it's for a close up or something, you know, something, and it has to be a deliberate choice. It can't, it, it can't just be vanity. You know, it has to be, it has to say something. Yeah, you know, I was talking to uh, uh, Ellen Curris. She yeah. uh, she's uh, Scorsese's documentary DP. She shot with Spike Lee, um, awesome career. And she, uh, you know, that I certainly used a lot of Black Promis. Um, the internet, if you've ever been on YouTube once and watched a, a camera video, uh, everyone's like, you got to get the Black Promise because it gives you the cinematic image and uh, heavy air quotes. And uh, me and Ellen were talking about filtration and she just, she like nearly spit. She was like, I never used the pro mist. It's just fuzzy. I'm making her sound angrier than she was, but uh, she was <laughs> like, uh, she's like, it's just fuzzy. You know, it doesn't have any sensibility. It's, it's like using a, um, a frost on a, on a light, you know, it just kicks it everywhere. And there's no, there's no directionality to it. And I was like, yeah. I guess I'm never using the pro mist again. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true. and I actually I used to use the Pro Mist as well. And again, you know, an eighth or a fourth is the most. Um, but uh, you know, it's it, it's good to experience those things and use these filters. And you know, I went from one extreme to the other. You know, from stacking incredible amount of filters to just maybe not using them at all. But it's it's, yeah. it's it was it's, it's it's I guess it's good to go through those through the motions and figure what out what. That, I was going to say, what did that uh, image look like at the end of the day? Was it just exactly what I'm thinking, just log and you can't get out of there. <laughs> exactly what it was. And, and, you know, we, we try to justify it by saying it was dreamy, you know, <laughs> but uh, the AC was definitely, the focus puller was not happy because it was very difficult for him to see and do his job. But, um, but yeah, it's yeah. Completely just like cloudy and weird, mm. but we thought it was cool. I don't know at the time, you know, again, it's, this was 10 years ago. Well, two things. One, it's always great to experiment. Uh, yeah. and, and two, uh, failure. And I want to put failure in aggressive quotes, uh, is always the best teacher, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't, you don't absolutely. learn from successes. Uh, actually the, ca the camera talk quickly reminded me of a question I was going to ask, which was you were, you had mentioned that you don't own any camera equipment, uh, yeah. in what, in, it sounds like it's helped you in some ways, but has it hurt you at all? Cause the camera ownership question comes up a lot. I think it, if it's very... necessary in some ways, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I did own a camera during film school and a little bit after that, but then that kind of just dropped off. Um, and I think early on in my career, at the, the beginning stages, you know, having that camera helped. And then, and then I stopped using the HVX. Actually, I, don't, I think I lost it, which is a pity. I have no idea what happened to it. It's just completely gone. I still have my XL2. Amazing that you have that. I wish <laughs> I still had my, my HVX. My but, mom um, does not throw anything away. <laughs> I don't yeah. think my mom threw away a camera. I think I just lost it, which again, I don't know how. Um, but anyway, um, so now I'm cameraless, right? Early on in the career. And there was a lot of producers and filmmakers looking for DP with a package. <clears throat> it was always like in the indie scene, that was like a big, big thing. And so in the, in the beginning, that was it was kind of tough. It was like, you know, I had to like figure out ways to develop relationships with camera owners, whether it was to a rental house or just like, you know, there was one person that just owned a red, but it wasn't a camera person, but they owned a full package for whatever reason. And I got into a deal with this person where it was like, yeah, you know, like, can I use your package as if it were mine? Um, and you'll get a cut out of the rental or whatever. <clears throat> but that was early on, you know, so I can try to um, access those, those, those types of jobs. And then I sort of found, started finding myself like not doing that anymore and just kind of like, uh, for sure now it, it doesn't hurt me at all because I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that 
people choose me to shoot their projects because of what I can contribute to it, not right. because it's convenient that I own this, that, and the other thing. So, um, and I think it's important to, to, to be viewed that way too, where it's, you know, you know, let's hire John because he can do this kind of thing that we like, um, not because he owns a camera. Um, and I, and I like that and it's, and it's freeing and it's, it's, you don't have this baggage of owning gear and, and getting it on the, on the project. And, and it just keeps you, I don't know, it keeps you kind of just pure and just like you go in and making the right equipment choices for the film, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's it, in, in, it's kind of a multifaceted question too, because on the one hand, owning a camera, uh, can net you a rental. You know, you, you can make some more True. money on the thing. And a lot, I know plenty of DPs who uh, push for their camera, beca- not because they know it's the best option, but because they know they'll get a kit rental on it. Um, but also it, it in many ways can um, uh, pigeonhole you into a look. You know, if, right. if you own an whatever, an Alexa Mini and a set of S4s, that's your look. That's and your look. May, maybe that's what people call you for. But as you're saying, it doesn't, they're not calling you for you. They're calling you for this uh, you know, made to order or not made to order it's opposite of that. It's the same every time, whatever that's called, you know, <laughs> that yeah, thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of, yeah. And, and, and I don't knock people that own gear. You know, I think that everyone has different reasons for doing this. You know, some people are really into the technical aspect of it, which is incredible. You know, some, um, I am I'm a big old nerd. I, I'll, I, I admit it freely. <laughs> I, I, I'm into it. But I have like my attention span with it kind of drops off after a while. Um, I, I think I'm, what excites me the most is just kind of like philosophical talks and story talks and just kind of like, how do we translate this emotion, this this feeling visually and, you know, cracking the code on things like that. And, uh, you know, I think that the technical aspect of it is absolutely important. And it's, and it's something that we should all know as cinematographers. But I try not to get too caught up on it and, and just to keep myself free to break the rules a little bit, you know, and, and not be so specific on, well, this camera's dynamic range is this, so I can't do this and this, right. you know, so I try not to be that, but it's, it's good to know these things to then know what rules you can break, you know? Yeah. The, uh, it, in many ways, digital has added so much co- unnecessary complexity that film didn't yeah. have. For um, sure. And this is something, you know, so a little behind the curtain for both you and anyone listening is, uh, a lot of times I'll end up doing, you know, eight of these interviews in a row. So my thoughts don't quite change between day to day. So I'm going to repeat something that probably is going to pop up in the last five weeks of uh, interviews, which is um, that uh, that thing you mentioned of, of, of focusing on the emotion that the images make uh, is definitely something that I've been thinking about a lot recently and um, trusting your feelings when it comes to uh, an image or, or the story you're trying to portray, um, as opposed to what might be quote unquote, technically correct, you know, right. Oh, we're, you know, three point lighting being the classic one. Oh, it's not three point. You know, I don't know if anyone does that anymore, but certainly in film school. Um, right. but just, you know, uh, looking at the text and then going like, yes, we should have a big soft key light, but that's not technically correct here. Right. So, you know, going with feeling, um, Absolutely. I'm finding far more important. Absolutely. I, I, I truly think that 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 is one of the most critical things, you know, going with your gut, going with feeling, going with what feels right. Um, and just and just following those instincts for sure. You know, um, I remember, you know, early on, there was like a little short that I shot <clears throat> and it was an intimate moment at a bar between two, two characters and they were having a really deep conversation. And I I single point lighting and just layering the background with elements of light. So there's a nice shape behind them, no backlight. And then on the opposite side, just complete darkness, negative fill. So one side of their face just kind of falls into complete darkness. And I remember my gaffer, he comes up to me and goes, Hey man, do you want like a balance in there? You know, do you want us to lift that up? And I was like, no, this is perfect. This is exactly the mood that I'm trying to elicit here. And he goes, yeah, but, you know, you look at the information, look at the false color, look at this. Um, there's just nothing there. It's in, it's, it's, you can't retrieve any of that back. And I go, that's okay. This is like, this is the mood. This is the intention. This is what we're trying to say and, 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 and what the scene calls for. And it's just an example of like, you know, 
go with what you feel and 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 sometimes people will question you and they will bring things up and, and it's okay to be questioned i welcome that actually because through through people questioning your decisions sometimes you'll start to see things that maybe you haven't seen and maybe it'll enhance the moment um or you know so i think i think it's important to embrace those questions you know remove ego and just listen to to these to these opinions um, but stick with what you think is 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 right and feels right and true to the moment and story. Yeah, you know, uh, the last interview I did with uh, Jaime Reynoso uh, had a quote towards the end where he was saying that it's, you know, it's good to f- be the person who uh, feels at home places, but it's even better to be the person who feels like a visitor every time. To always come in with fresh eyes and to always think of, you know, because maybe that guy comes up to you and goes like, hey, you've got nothing in the waveform. And you go, oh, shit, no, I actually did want something in there, you know, or maybe exactly. not. Exactly. Exactly. And that's 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 the point, too. It's like, you know, listening to these voices and, and seeing their perspective, um, but also, you know, and just, just staying true to yourself for sure. Yeah, that is also there is precedent for your move too, which is uh, obviously the uh, the Godfather, where uh, Gordon Willis was just like, "I'm not giving them shit in the edit. <laughs> it is that black is black. There's no coming back from this." Nice, um, yeah. Oh man, Gordon Willis. I just I just saw that uh, they just did the Godfather 50th anniversary release, and I got to see it in the Dolby Theater, and uh, right. still holds up. Uh, <laughs> Great. Imagine that. Um, you know, I've I've kept you a little over the hour, so I'll, I'll let you go. But we uh, we like to end the the podcast with the same two general questions. Um, one, the first one being, uh, is there a quote or um, a piece of advice or or just kind of uh, a phrase maybe that's bounced around in your head um, that stuck with you throughout your career at all? Absolutely. Um, I think for me and the philosophy that I you know take day to day. Is to completely remove ego within the process. You know, remove ego and just embrace other people's ideas. Embrace, you know, like we were touching before. Embrace these questions on your choices, on your craft. Be open to new ideas. Be open to new people. You know, and constantly be a student. You know, constantly learn, uh, look to learn and look to improve, and um, you know, and ingest as much art in film and different as you know different uh you know platforms as you can um yeah i'm just kind of like going off but there's really truly is just it's just removing the ego kind of always being a student and being in a position to learn and improve is is like the thing that i really focus on because i think that'll help me to to just get better every time you know yeah plus learning's fun it yeah. sucks being the person who knows everything is horrible. It's a horrible feeling. Yeah, I don't pretend to be that person. Cause in fact, it's true. I, I don't know everything. And I lean on my collaborators and, and, and the people around me to kind of help me, you know, help me and contribute to making the image a better version of what I could ever like, you know, um, think of, you know, so whether it's my key grip or my gaffer and I'll express an idea to them, or a feeling and then they they contribute on top of that too and now someone else contributes on top of that and now all of a sudden we have this this beautiful collaboration and and, and i think the end result would, would be much better for it you know there's some folks that are just like so no this is what i want i don't want to hear anything and, and i don't know it's just not the way i like to work yeah and we've i've said this before in a few of the past podcast recently but uh that collaboration that uh that uh, team problem solving is very addictive it feels yeah. good for all of y'all it to really be like does. aimed at a problem like that. Yeah. Um, second question. Uh, your film is in, is in a double feature. You're programming the second film. What is it? Repeat that question. So if, if your movie's in a double feature, what's the other yeah. movie? Huh. I would say probably and it might be biased because I really like this filmmaker um, and the choices he makes. Probably Caché by my, Michael Haneke. Um, okay. Yeah. I think that what's great about Michael Haneke that Mo McRae shares is that there are deliberate choices in what they do. You know, you look at these films and you look at these filmmakers and you can see the voice behind the choices. You know, you can see their personality a little bit. You can see their artistry. 
Um, and, and I think that's really special. I love that. I love watching a film and looking at bizarre, you know, not very traditional choices and just feeling, wow, like I, I respect that. I, I, I feel that like, and Michael Hanna Haneke does that really well, where you would think that he would take a traditional approach on, doc, you know, on, on photographing a scene, constructing a scene. And it's, it's just completely, you know, untraditional, I guess. Um, and Mo does that really well too, where, you know, uh, he would, you know, just look for ways to introduce his philosophy and his voice into, into um, filmmaking. And I, and I, and I love that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome, man. Um, yeah. Well, like, like I said, the, the film is fantastic. Uh, I'm sure they're going to mm-hmm. fucking mm-hmm. love it over at South by. Uh, and, and I, and I wish you all the best next time you do something, please uh, come back and, and we'll talk about that. Oh, I'd love to. That'd be great. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the F at R Matbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>